amazing love, how can it be that you, my King, would die for me? Amazing love, I know it's true, and it's my joy to honor you. Week seven of our series, The Effect of Life. And you know, the premise on this is that we're tired of living a life that's not effective. Um, And and I'm not talking about this not effective as far as my job or any of those other things. I'm talking about the life of Christ. And then we realize that he actually gave us eight things to think about as we walk through these eight things um, that we need to add to our life. Because... If you thought the minute you got saved, you prayed a prayer with somebody, raised your hand, maybe filled out a card, came forward down an aisle, you thought, that's it, then let me just tell you, that wasn't it. That really wasn't it. And that's what Peter's really trying to tell us, because he says, there is so much more God desires for you. God didn't save you so he could come and sit in the seat. God saved you so that you could be busy being a Christ follower, an active Christ follower for him. And that's the whole deal that we want to understand today. As we talk about this, and he, he, he gave us these eight things, really there's seven character traits, and then we, we found an eighth one that's sort of hidden, it was that intense effort that we're supposed to add, and we talked about that in week two, but we've been through now, and this is week seven, we've been through all these different ones, and let me just give you this, for those of you who've been here for, with us and you've been following along, these things are actually building and they're getting harder every week. Last week, Tracy preached about perseverance, and if you're like, yeah, I got that under control, you're full of it. I'm just telling you, that may not be a nice thing to say, but perseverance is a hard thing to keep doing every day what needs to be done despite all the difficulties of life. And that's what Tracy preached about last week. And so this week we're going to talk about one that's even, uh, I think, even harder. And, and like I said, we've got three left to go, and then we're going to talk about the benefits and the blessings um, of, of the whole effect of life. But <clears throat> as we go through this, they are getting harder. And today we're going to talk about godliness. And, and when I think about this, Peter would be an excellent guy to write about this whole aspect of being godly because he went to church a lot. No, not really. That's not what Peter would tell you. The reason that he was godly or he could talk about godliness is because he walked with Jesus Christ. Picture this. The Garden of Eden was this place where man walks with God every day, talks with God, spends time, quality time with God. They were, they were in such harmony that they could actually be in the presence of God. And then Satan enters in and he tempts man 
And he makes this huge mistake choosing uh, the temporary over the eternal. And so God drives man out of the Garden of Eden. We know that story in the background. But here's the, here's the dividing. Since that time when God drives man out of the Garden of Eden all the way down to the time that we find the story of Jesus being born, there's this disconnect with man and God. I mean, that's really, if you want to know what the Old Testament is really all about, it's, it's God trying to tell people about himself in a way that they would understand. And nobody did. Because there was always this disconnect because we had separated ourselves from God. It wasn't God separating himself from us. We were separating ourselves from God because of our sin. Our sin separated us, and because of that, there was always these obstacles. The children of Israel found the obstacle of God's holiness was so great. They couldn't even touch the mountain that God would come down to give them the law. There was this curtain. When his Shekinah glory came on upon the tabernacle, no one could come into that. But in the temple itself, when they built this temple in Jerusalem, there was this curtain, this huge, thick curtain, so, so thick that it, it just nothing could penetrate through it, and God would be on the other side of it unless you were the, the designated high priest and you had to be blameless. You had to offer uh, certain sacrifices and go through certain ritual cleansings just to go in there to offer your sacrifice for the people. And you could only do that at certain times. It wasn't available to everybody. It wasn't available to anybody. And then John writes in John chapter 1, the word became flesh. And most of the time we read that and say, that's so cool. Jesus came to be flesh and dwelt among us. And what John is revealing is a great truth that we have to embrace in our lives. The truth that not just that Jesus came and was born in a manger than we celebrate over Christmas and give gifts and have a good time. But you know what? The truth of the matter is, For the first time in history since the Garden of Eden, God is now flesh, and he's like you and me, and he's accessible. See, up to that point, God was not accessible. He was always at a distance. He was always far off. He was always scary. He was always giving rules, and we we cowered about all those things. And now Jesus comes in and says, hey, you know what? I'm here to love you. I'm here to do the things you couldn't do. I'm here to walk with you. And while he's doing that, These men, these 12 men, got a chance, and there was money more than just these 12, but these 12 disciples got up close to him, and they walked with him day by day. In fact, three of them were really close, because everywhere Jesus went, they were there, and one of these guys was a guy named Peter. And so when Peter says, hey, you need to add to your faith some godliness, he's not talking about, hey, go to church more often, go to a Bible study more often, go go do religious things. What he's saying is be more like Christ. Live the life that Christ lived, and that's why Jesus came. And that's the reflection we talk about. See, when we get down to it in our study today, we're going to look, and if you have your Bibles, turn to 2 Peter chapter chapter 1. I just want for our launching point, we're going to look at the verses that we're talking about here. Peter says this in 2 Peter chapter 1, in verse number number 5, he says, For this very reason, and we've read this a couple times. This is part of our text. For this very reason, make every effort, that's an intense effort, to add to your faith that foundational, I'm saved, I'm a Christian, first thing is goodness. That's being good without being a goody-goody. That's being like Jesus, but at a different level. That's doing acts of, of good works. Add to your faith goodness, and to goodness, knowledge. And we talked about that knowledge is not knowledge as far as uh, academic knowledge. It's knowledge as far as discipleship knowledge. It's about knowing God in a relation, a relationship. And then to add to that, self-control. And to self-control, perseverance. And that's what Tracy talked about last week. And to perseverance, godliness. And so when we look at this, and, and I told Tracy as we're developing these messages, hey, it's hard to develop an expository sermon off of one word, right? It really is. Godliness is all he gives us. And and I sat back and said, well, thanks, Peter. You didn't do a lot of help for me when I'm preaching this message. What do I do now? I preach one word? You know, though, as I sat back and I read through what Peter had to say, you realize the reason that Peter didn't talk too much about this word in 2 Peter is because he spent most of 1 Peter talking about it. And so really what we're going to do is we're going to be in the book of 1 Peter today. So if you want to turn back, (laughs) his first writing really helps us there. Uh, we're going we're gonna to be in the, the second chapter of 1 Peter if you want to launch there. But you know what? As you grow in Christ, and that's what Peter understood. Peter's this guy as he's growing through all these different character traits that we're talking about here. As you grow in Christ, he makes you increasingly more like him. That's what Peter would say. I look more, Peter would tell you on his last days that he looked more like Jesus than he did on his first days. And I'm not talking about the actual appearance. 
how he acted, what he did. See, when Peter first met Jesus, he was very impulsive. He was very self-willed. He was strong-willed. He was arrogant. He had all these different traits that were, were bad. And now he knows Jesus, and Jesus has worked on his life a lot, and he's changed because when you see him, as he's writing his last letter there, the second Peter, before he dies, Peter's a different man. He really is. And what we under, had to understand is that the fact that we all need to grow in Christ. And that's the truth behind this. We all need. Nobody's got it figured out. You can turn to any television evangelist if you want. I don't care who he is. They don't have it figured out. There's no pastor on this planet that's got it figured out. In fact, one of the problems is sometimes people act like they've got it figured out, and then that's a scary position for them to be in. See, we all need to have someone who can disinfect our hearts in this day of COVID, right? We all need someone who can clean up our habits, who can vacuum our values, who can sweep the dirt out of our minds, who can launder our motives, who can spruce up our attitudes, who can tidy up our testimonies. And that's what godliness does for us. See, growing in godliness is a lifelong endeavor, and that's why it's so hard, because becoming like Christ is that journey. And that's why the mission of Maple Springs, and hopefully you're getting the idea that we say it enough around here, maybe you'll, you'll remember it too, but the mission of Maple Springs is to lead people into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. That's the idea, because we're all on that journey. We're all trying to grow on that. Paul said it like this over in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, in verse number 1. He says, therefore... <laughs> And he's, he's responding to all the things he's written to these Corinthian believers. He says, therefore, since we have these promises, dear friends, let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates body and spirit. And, and that, that's not just a, a washing, but what he's saying here is, when I add godliness, when I add that Christ-likeness to my mind, myself, then I've I'm, I'm got this idea of growing in Christ. He says, perfecting holiness out of reverence for God. Perfecting holiness. And those are words that are all churchy and scary, but the truth of the matter is what Peter would tell you is just be like Jesus. Just be like Jesus. What is godliness? Godliness, then, is simply becoming more like God every day. It's becoming more like Jesus Christ. In fact, it's, it's what the author of Hebrews, in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, would tell us this. He said this, the Son, that is Jesus Christ, is the radiance of God's glory. I love the way he says it. It's the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. The exact representation. Some of the other uh, versions say the express image. But what they're getting the idea here is something we understand pretty clearly these days. I'm amazed every time I've taken a trip to a third world country and, and we have these fancy digital cameras or phones or whatever we take with us, and we take a picture, and then you can show the people the picture, they are just shocked how quickly you can have a picture of them. It's almost scary to them at times. But really, what the author of Hebrews is saying here is, hey, when you looked at Jesus, you know who you see? God. When you look at Jesus, he's the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. And after he had provided uh, purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. And what he's saying here is Jesus, while he walked with us, he was the exact representation of God. He was everything you need to know about who God is. I know a lot of people get hung up on the Old Testament God because they don't understand a lot of it. But you know what? Jesus came so you don't have to understand the Old Testament God. You need to understand the New Testament Jesus. That's the idea. And Jesus, when he leaves, you know what he says? He says, you guys are going to do more than I did because you guys now have God living in you, and that's the Holy Spirit. And if you come on Sunday nights, we talk about that. We just start a study in the book of Acts, and that's, what, that's my plug for that, Sunday nights. But the truth of the matter is, if we want to know what godliness, this trait to have an effective life, if you're going to be effective as a Christian, and this is the only way you can do that, you have to add godliness, which is the image of Christ in our lives, the image of God, Jesus Christ. And so the main point that we've got for today is this. The essence of the Christian life, what is it? It is to increasingly resemble Jesus Christ. That's it. The essence of the Christian life is to increasingly resemble Jesus Christ. Now, I don't know, maybe you went to a church and they gave you a checklist of things you had to do, you had to give, you had to come to this service and do all that. That's not really what the Christian life's all about. The essence, as Paul would tell you, as Peter would tell you, the essence of the Christian life is to increasingly resemble Jesus Christ. So we'd have to ask things like, what would Jesus do? I know that was an old one that, that has come, come and gone in trendiness in Christian circles, but that's the truth. What would Jesus do? 
we're supposed to look like Jesus to the world around us. And so <laughs> Peter, I already told you this, Peter wrote more about godliness in his first writing, that book of 1 Peter, uh, and, and really what he was doing is he was t- telling us about how Jesus responded to the circumstances of life so that we would understand that. So if you have a Bibles, we're going to be in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verses 9 through 12, and let me read those real quick for you because we're going to pull out some truths here that Peter helps us understand about adding godliness. He says this, and, and I love this, and we'll talk about the language here, but he starts off and he says, but you... Now, when he says you, and those are the first two words, but you, you better realize that he was talking about some things prior to this. So if you have your Bibles open and you're looking there, look back to verse number 8, and what you find out, he starts talking in verse number 8 about the people who rejected God. And so he's contrasting the people who rejected God, who didn't want to follow God, and here they are, and he says, but you, but you, and you could put your name there, but, put your name in there, but you are, and here it is, a chosen people, chosen by God. I don't know about you, but one of the, the, the biggest dilemmas in my life as a little kid was every time we played a lot more outdoors than, than kids do today. I understand that. We didn't have video games the same way or any of those. We certainly didn't have internet, cell phones, and all those things to occupy us. So we played outside. And you know what the biggest dilemma for a kid when you're playing outside is? When do you get chosen? You know what I'm talking about? Hey, let's play kickball. Hey, let's play softball. Hey, let's play baseball. Let's, let's do whatever. And they start choosing up sides. And I'm just telling you, especially if guys get chosen, if you get chosen after a girl, no offense, ladies, but if you got chosen after a girl, that hurts your ego a lot when you're a little kid. I'm just telling you. And the worst thing, and I always felt sad. I was never the worst. I, was never, I wasn't always the best, but I was never the worst. You know what's great, though? When he writes this, he says, you're a chosen people. That means God selected you, and you didn't even have to qualify. You are a first pick, draft pick, right? You're a first round choice. You're a chosen people, and really, the image is God in the Old Testament. How He reaches out out of and 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 out of divine providence and His sovereignty, God reaches out and says, "You know what? I'm choosing Abraham, and He's going to be the father of a great multitude. He's going to choose." The people of Jacob, which becomes Israel, the the nation of Israel, to be his people. And that is a chosen people, and that's what he's referencing here. He says, you're a chosen people. That's awesome. You're chosen special. A royal priesthood. Uh, You know, you're not just anybody. You're royalty. A holy nation. God's special possession. And that's the words I underline there. God's special possession. Because maybe you walked in today and you didn't feel so special. Maybe you felt like you've been trampled down, you've been pushed down. But get, hey, part of this godliness thing is the fact that God chose you and you're a special possession to him. Why? Because he's got a purpose for you. That you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. And that's the truth. Because he's not hiding the fact that we were all nasty sinners. There's nothing good about you and me. We weren't first-round draft picks because of what we did. It's because he liked us so much that he decided to pick us anyway. Because we were called out of darkness. We were darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Dear friends, I urge you, as foreigners and exiles, and that's so important we have to understand that term too, we are not part, you know, we're not Christians, uh, <clears throat> Christians that one day will go to heaven as, and, and, and start living there. We're citizens of heaven that are sojourning here on this planet. We need to cut our ties here more so. He says, we're foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires. That's part of that holiness, which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives, and here's the tough part, live such good lives that the pagans... Those people that are down at the bar on, on Saturday nights. The people that, that won't come to church with you. Those pagans that live among you, that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they might see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. That's the return of Jesus Christ is what he's talking about there. See, this whole idea here is that we are trying to understand our identity. And part of that, as Christ followers, is the is the the godliness aspect. See, as, as citizens of Jesus Christ, as possessions of Jesus Christ, godliness really only begins when you truly meet God himself through Jesus Christ. See, the first step of your journey of adding godliness is salvation. 
It really is. And I know that's another Christianese word. But the truth is, if you're here today and you're listening or you're watching online and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, then you're off the hook. You don't have to add godliness because the first step of adding godliness is knowing Jesus Christ. Now, we want you to be introduced to Jesus Christ, and we think it's a better way as Christ followers, but you're off the hook today if you're not a Christian. But for the rest of us, if you claim to be a Christian, you're required to be more like Jesus. That's what Peter's trying to say. You need to add this whole aspect to your life. That's what he's trying to say. It only begins, though, when you actually truly accept Jesus Christ and get to know him. See, Peter discusses godliness by reminding us of who we are in Christ. And he zeroes in on three specific things in this passage. Number one, he he talks about the fact that we are God's possession. God's possession. In verses number two, we already talked about that. You're God's special possession. See, in verse number eight, I told you this, Peter described a people in the world who rejected Jesus Christ. And in verse nine, he started off, "But, but you, you. And he goes on and gives you this list, your royal priesthood, all these different things. But he says, you're God's special possession. See, when you came to Christ, you are his special person. He has a special purpose. He has a special life. And that's what Peter's trying to say. Hey, I was just a fisherman. The world didn't want me. I was one of the lowest of lows. I was a nobody in society. And then Jesus came by one day and said, hey, follow me. And I became his special possession. That's the truth. And see, when we add godliness, to add godliness, we have to remember who we belong to or whom we belong to, to say it grammatically correct. It doesn't sound right, but that's how you say it. We have to remember whom we belong to. And Peter, through his journey, even to the point when he denies Jesus Christ at the the trial of Jesus, when he denies him three times, you know what Peter had to realize that day? I'm wrong because I am turning my back on the person I belong to. As a Christ follower, I belong to God. I don't get to make choices away from God. I don't get to make choices away from him. He owns me. And that's the truth of godliness. See, when I want to become godly in my life, I have to realize that I belong to God and I'm his special possession. See, God called me out of darkness and to walk into the light, into that marvelous light. And that's the first step. The second second aspect uh, that he zeroes in on is not just that we're God's possession, but we're also God's pilgrims. Now, (laughs) I know pilgrims has a historic meaning for us because of Thanksgiving and and how our country is founded, but don't get that image in your mind. That's not the image I want you to have. Um, We're we're talking about something totally different. Um, I remember, actually, um, we worked in a school. uh, School, actually, my wife graduated from high school. She graduated from, they were the, uh, their mascot was the pilgrims. I always thought, that's such a weak mascot. Uh, You know, (laughs) hey, let's go out and fight the pilgrims. They're not going to win because they're just pilgrims. But anyway, I, I don't know. That doesn't have anything to do with this. Don't get the wrong image in your mind. What, what Peter talks about, though, is the fact that we are sojourners here. We're exiles. We're foreigners. Uh, and, and this isn't a concept that's new to Peter. He's not introducing it to us for the very first time. There are countless numbers of times. In fact, one of those is found in Psalm. The psalmist writes this in Psalm 84, verse, uh, verse 5. He said this, Blessed are those whose strength is in you, whose hearts are set on pilgrimage. And that's interesting. He's telling us to remember where we are headed, who we are. Not just the fact that we're owned by God, but the fact that we aren't settlers here. We aren't earthbound people. We are on a pilgrimage. And when we're at our best, we remember in our hearts that we're on this pilgrimage with God. And that's the whole idea here. We're just a traveler passing through. And so many of our Christian songs of of yesteryear said things like that. I'm just traveling on. And that's the whole idea here. But Peter, he really took this to heart as he's writing his letter to these. And by the way, the letter to 1 Peter is written to people who are in problems. And he goes on in three different passages in, in 1 Peter. He says this in 1 Peter 1, verse number 1, as he opens up, he says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, and listen to who he's writing to, To God's elect, that means the people who are called by God, saved. Exiles scattered throughout the providences of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. And what what he's really focusing on is you guys are exiles. Exiles from what? You're not exiles from anything other than the world. See, once you become part of God's family, nobody else wants you here on earth. That's the truth. 
And that's what God says. I want you. You're my pilgrims. This isn't a place to set up permanent residence. Don't get so entangled by the world that you are here to make such a a permanent residence. Put something in heaven is what Jesus would have talked about. Over in verse number 17 of chapter 1, he says this. He says, since you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially, live out, and listen to this, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. I don't know how many of you guys have ever been to a foreign country, but as a, as a large American, I stick out. <laughs> I don't know if you ever noticed that. Um, it's, 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 it's hilarious. Um, one of the first trips I took to Africa, um, and some of the Africans are pretty gullible, I'll just be honest with you. They haven't seen a whole lot. They don't know a whole lot. They know a few big-name American stars and all this, but um, there, isn't a, there wasn't an anybody even close in Africa to my size. Um, in fact, I remember the first trip we took, one of the, the guys who lived there, he said, hey, make sure you never let anybody steal your luggage because I can't take you anywhere where we could find clothes to fit you. Um, I'm serious. Most of the men in here would not be able to find clothes to fit them either because we are so much bigger than the African men are. But I stood there and, and that, this one day, and uh, I was getting ready to preach through a translator, and that's one of the hardest things to do. And I was getting ready to go up there and preach. And the guy's introducing me. And the next thing I know, and he's talking in Swahili, which I didn't understand much Swahili, so I didn't have a clue what he's saying. The next thing I know, though, he says something, and everybody goes, <gasps> and they're, they're, some of them start laughing, but they're just looking at me, and they're just, they're just shocked. And so I walked up on stage, and uh, <clears throat> I looked at the guy. I said, what did you tell him about me? And he said, I told him that, and this is, this is the truth. He said, I looked at him and told him that, that if they knew who Shaquille O'Neal was, how big he was, that I was his little brother. <laughs> they believed that. I'm serious. I, now, they, don't, they really don't know exactly who Shaquille O'Neal is. They just know he's a big guy. And so they're like, ooh, wow. And so all the time they kept thinking, I mean, they, they had people come up to me and ask me questions about that. But I'm just telling you, when you go to a foreign country, you stand out. You really do. Um, I remember my nephew, uh, he grew up, his, his mom and dad were missionaries there in Africa. And uh, my nephew has very light skin, blonde hair. And um, he really got irritated because um, when he went, hit high school years, junior high and high school years, he actually went to a boarding school because it was the best education around, went to a boarding school. And he'd get up in the mornings, he was really athletic, he'd get up in the mornings and go jogging. And when he went out jogging, he would have probably 50 kids follow him around. Can you imagine this pack of 50 people running with you um, just to see what's going on? And every time he stopped or did anything, they would come up to him and they would touch his skin. And they wanted to see if it would rub off the white. No lie, they did that. Um, They pulled on his hair to see if his hair was really, you know, was real or he was wearing a wig or something like that. Because they didn't understand it. And, And I think when I see that and I see like... Peter telling us, live out your time as foreigners here. In reverent fear, what he's saying is, stand out. Stand out, not because you blend in. I think so often, we as Christ followers, we're like, I just want to blend in, make sure nobody knows that I'm a Christian. You ever seen the people who are at a restaurant and they're trying to pray and they're like, (laughs) amen. And And you're like, was that a prayer or are you coughing? What Peter's saying here is, be more like Jesus. You know, everywhere Jesus went, he stood out, didn't he? In fact, he was so famous, or infamous, you could say, he was so famous for some of the things he did that crowds overwhelmed him and kept him at times from doing what he really wanted to do. It was hard to do ministry. In fact, he had to sneak off at times to try and get away from the crowds just so he could get a little bit of rest in his own life, just so he could find time to pray by himself. But Jesus here is the model, and if we're going to be godly, what we have to do is learn to be, as Peter would tell us, learn to be uh, foreigners here. Not be, hey, I blend in because I'm just like everybody else. That's not the whole idea here. He goes on to finish it out in in chapter 2 and verse 11. He says this, Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles. Once again, that's a combination of both the words we're talking about. To do what? To abstain from sinful desires which which wage war against your soul. And that really fits in that whole blend of holiness that we saw Paul talked about there in Corinthians chapter 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Verse number one, we started with. You're God's pilgrim. We're we're scattered about. Yes, we're we're pressured into a society that we don't fit in with because we don't have the same belief structure. I get that. But we're not supposed to 
be like them. We're not supposed to adopt the cultures of this world. We're supposed to be different. In fact, one of the signs of godliness is an increasingly wanting to be where Jesus is. And that's what Peter would say. I long Think about Paul said that too. To be, to be present with the Lord is the greatest thing in my life. That's what he told people. And that's what Peter is saying here. Hey, we're, we're pilgrims. We're just traveling through. Don't set such ties up. Don't really love this world. And the third thing he talks about here is not just that we're God's possession, God's pilgrims, but we're also God's platform. He tells us this as he concludes his, his, his idea here. In verses number 9 and, and 12, he says this, You're a chosen people, royal priesthood, holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Did you get that? That you may declare. That's the whole idea. God wants us to declare the praises of him who called you out into, uh, of darkness into his wonderful light. That's your mission in life. That's the platform God's given us. We're the platform for God. See, it's crazy to think that, that God would entrust the salvation of the world into our hands. But that's what he's done. He's called us to be something special here, and that takes godliness. See, to grow in godliness, we have to work hard to maintain our own honorable conduct. We have to live like Christ, blameless. Christ was that, that one, it's amazing, when you read through the trial of Christ, no one could find fault with him. Then I was reading through the trial of Paul in, in the book of Acts, and you know what everybody says about him? There's nothing that he should be here tried for his life for. It's crazy. And I think if both those guys live that way, then that's what God is calling us to be, his platform. We're supposed to live a life so that we can say the praises of God who called us from our darkness into into his wonderful light. That's the whole idea here. But I want you to know this whole godliness aspect is not enough that we just talk about our identity in Christ, as Peter would tell us, that we have to learn how to express it. And God here, I think Peter, through Peter, has given us three ways we can express our identity. Number one, we'd say this. It's about ownership. It's about ownership. The truth of the matter is godliness is about ownership, and we're supposed to live like we belong. Ownership. Uh, the, when you realize that you are God's special possession, you have to think twice about the things you do, the places you go, the things you say, the feelings that you harbor the rage, the anger you might have about somebody, how you treat people, the habits that you keep, the entertainment that you consume. And Paul said it like this over in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 and 20 says, Do you not know that your bodies are the temples of the Holy Spirit, who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You are bought with a price. And that's the key there. You're not your own. You were bought with a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Over in Romans, he wrote this in Romans chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. He says, and you also are among the Gentiles who are called to belong. And notice that. He says, you're called to belong to Jesus Christ. To all in Rome who are loved by God and called to be his holy people, grace and peace to you from God our Father from the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's his opening there. And then chapter 14, verse number 8 of Romans, he says, if we live, we live for the Lord. And if we die, we die for the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. And that's the point. And I think that's what we have to understand. If we're going to understand that we're possessions of God, that we're pilgrims for God, that we're platform for God, we have to realize that the, <clears throat> the, the idea here is that um, uh, godliness is about ownership and we have to live like we belong but secondly we have to realize this godliness is about citizenship which means we need to keep your eyes on heaven he says over in Paul says over in Colossians chapter 3 and verse number 2 he says set your minds on things above not on earthly things and I think so often we are so distracted we were talking about this a little bit in Sunday school and I, I should have referred to this verse it would have been a better verse the difference between first century Christians and probably 21st century Christians is this verse right here. We are so much more distracted by the things of this world. We live as if we're making our permanent residence here. And those first century Christians, they gave their stuff away. They gave it to the poor, the needy, the sick. They did whatever was necessary to help somebody else. And it meant sometimes giving up their own stuff 
because they set their minds on things above, not on the things of tomorrow, next week. You wouldn't hear any of their, the Christians in the first century going, hey, I can't come back to church tonight because i got to get ready for work tomorrow. Hmm, not them. They set their minds on things above, not on the things of tomorrow, not on the things that are temporary. And I think some of us, we say, you know what, I will follow Christ after I get done following my boss, my job, my entertainment, my social habits, and everything else. And that's not the call to godliness. Godliness says, hey, you know what? Christ first, everything else secondary. Everything else secondary. In the last chapter of, of Peter 2, he talked about the return uh, as Peter's writing his last words. And think about this. This is his last words on earth. Peter says this, but the day of the Lord. <laughs> He's talking about the return of God. The day of the Lord will, ret- will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar and the elements will be destroyed by fire and the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. He goes on to say, since everything will be destroyed in this way, and this is the question, knowing what I just said, since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? Wow. That's that's the question, isn't it? If you know Jesus is coming back, Peter says, what kind of person should you be then? And then he answers the question. He says, you ought to live holy and godly lives. Godliness, once again. He keeps going in that thought. And a couple of verses down, verses 13 and 14, he says in, in, in 2 Peter chapter 3, he says this, but in keeping with his promises, remember those, those promises, those great and precious promises back we saw in, in chapter 1, verse 3 and 4? He says, but in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, make every effort. There it is again. Remember that? The intense effort? Make intense effort to be found what? Spotless and blameless and at peace with him. What he's telling us is that effective life is a life that really looks more like him. The third aspect is not just citizenship, but stewardship. That's the third aspect. (laughs) <laughs> this stewardship means I'm going to carry out our assignments. That's the whole idea. Because when you talk about being a steward, the word steward means I'm responsible to a master for everything I do, everything I have. Truth is, we talk about stewardship most awfully when we talk about our possessions. But really, in God's eyes, he's talking about our lives. And God's going to ask you, as he's already told us, that our, our assignment is to be the platform for God. Then by stewardship methods, we need to carry out our assignment. Which means the question is, is how are we telling people about God's truth? How are we telling people? Hey, you know what? Most unsaved people aren't coming here. We have to go out and find them. That's the Great Commission. It's not about coming here. It's about going there. In fact, Jesus said in Matthew 28, verse 19 and 20, says go. And that word in the Greek means go and keep going. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. And make disciples and baptize people. And he gives us this, this big command to the church. That's us. And it's about stewardship that we're supposed to be carrying out an assignment. That's what godliness is, as we add to that aspect. See, Paul didn't use the word stewardship as much. He did in 1 Corinthians chapter 4. But in, in his writings, he also, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20, he calls us ambassadors. And we've talked about this before. In verse 20, he says, We, therefore, as Christ followers, as the church, as he's talking about it, he says, We, therefore, are Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. Does that make sense? You are the guy that's supposed to be introducing the neighbors, the people you meet all the time, to Jesus Christ, because God is making his appeal through us. When people don't go to heaven, it's on us. It's not on them, it's on us. Because God is making his appeal through us, and if we don't tell him, then we haven't been good stewards of God's resources. So he, Paul, Paul finishes out his statement, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. And what he's telling people is, hey, that's my job. Paul, when he finishes his life, you know what he says? I can rest assured that I have told everybody on the whole planet, everybody in the known world, I, I preach the gospel to everybody. That's amazing when you think about it. He had no social media. He, he didn't have Facebook Live. He didn't have any of the resources we have today. But Paul reached the entire known world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Why? Because he was a good steward of what God gave him. So as we think this thing through and as we finish it up, Paul wrote this in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7. He tells Timothy, have nothing to do with godless myths or all old wives' tales, things that are a waste of time. 
But he says this, rather, this is the importance, rather train yourself to be godly. Train yourself to be godly. That's the importance that we're talking about here. It's something you have to do. It's an effort. That train yourself to be godly isn't going to be this, like, come to one church service and you got it. No, it's a, it's a lifelong endeavor. You know, <laughs> a good actor, I don't know who you think good actors are, and I, I'm not talking about their morals. I'm just talking about people that can make you believe that they're actually the person they're act- impersonating. A good actor is amazing. I appreciate a good actor. But you realize a good actor spends years and years and years working to, to become the person they're impersonating, the person they're portraying, the person they're doing. And, and they, they, they work on specific details, maybe how they talk, how they walk. They do all these different things, and they sacrifice a lot of themselves to do these things. I've heard of uh, these famous actors who've either gained weight or lost weight to, to play different roles, and it's just amazing. And I, when I read this verse that Paul's telling Timothy... I see that as what Paul's talking about for you and for me. He's saying, you know what? Learn to imitate Jesus Christ. Impersonate him. Train yourself to be godly. And that doesn't happen in one night. That's something that's an ongoing message over and over again. Because once again, the essence, the essence of the Christian life, what's it, what is it all about? The essence of the Christian life is to increasingly resemble Jesus Christ. So are you effective? How do you know? To have the effective life means I'm going to look just like Jesus Christ. Let me have every head bowed and every eye closed. Every head bowed and every eye closed. Platforms and pilgrims and possessions, that's what we talked about today. And and we talked about the fact that God's got a plan for you. First of all, though, if you're not here and if you're not knowing Jesus Christ, your personal Savior, if you are not a Christ follower, maybe you've got questions, maybe you've got concerns, maybe you've got doubts, we'd like to help you with those. That's our goal. That's our aim. If you don't know Jesus Christ, your Savior, there is someone here today that can show you more about him. If you have questions, we'd like to try and find answers. We don't know it all. We're not trying to say that. we just like to help you with the questions that are, are, are basic to Christianity. We'd like to introduce you to Jesus Christ. Because this whole effective life, it really is only through Jesus Christ you can be effective. That's the truth. So if you don't know Jesus Christ, and and once again, I have to say this. I'm not saying, do you know, do you know about uh, about, uh, the Baptist way or Methodist way or Presbyterian way or Catholic way or any other way? There's only one way to Jesus. And it's not through a denomination. It's through a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. That's the truth. You can't throw money in an offering plate to know Jesus. You can't come to a Bible study to know Jesus. It's knowing him personally, having developed a relationship. So if you've never done that, I, I'm not asking if you've been baptized. I'm not asking if, you, uh, you know, if you're a church member or any of those other things. I'm asking, do you know Jesus Christ? My own personal story is I grew up in a pastor's home grew up in a good Christian home, went to church every day of my life. And you know what? I didn't know Jesus Christ. I woke up to that reality as a freshman in high school. I didn't know Jesus Christ. We want you to know Jesus. That's the first step of godliness. But for most of us, most of us in this room, most of us probably watching on the video, hey, you know, the truth of the matter is we know Jesus. So the next question I have is, what are you doing about the fact that you know him? How is your identity in Jesus Christ, how is that making your life grow in Christ? Are you more effective? Have you become that person who understands that you're God's possession and you belong to him? So he dictates your movements. He dictates what you do in life. Not your job, not your spouse, not your kids, not your your culture. God does. Who's dictating your life to you? Maybe, maybe today you didn't realize that you were a pilgrim, you, and maybe that word throws you off a little bit, but maybe you've set up permanence here. Maybe you live for everything that you're trying to, to establish here in this life. You're trying to make your little kingdom here. And you know what Jesus said? We're supposed to pray that God's kingdom comes, that it comes into a reality in our lives. See, we're not supposed to be building our homes as kingdoms. We're not supposed to be building our families as kingdoms. We're supposed to be building God's kingdom. Are you doing that? 
Maybe today you, you didn't realize or maybe you never thought about it that you're God's platform. When people die and go to hell, it's on us because we didn't tell people. That's the Great Commission. So are you telling every person you meet about Jesus Christ? Do you live in such a way that, Paul, that Peter would tell you, you live in such a way that when they point their finger at you, there's nothing they can really point at you because you resemble Jesus Christ? Are you living purposefully? Have you made a resolution, a, a desire to live the God, godly life? It's about imitating God. If you haven't, today's the day. Just a minute, we're gonna we're gonna stand and sing a verse of invitation. As always, you don't have to sing. We have people that will sing for you. What you need to do is whatever Jesus tells you to do, whatever the Holy Spirit speaking to your heart right now. Whatever you feel uneasy about, that's the decision you need to make. Won't you make that decision? Don't walk out of here the same that you did when you came in. Let God change you. Be different. Be reconciled to Christ. God, we thank you for this time. We thank you for your word. We thank you for Peter and the change of his life that allowed us to see what the effect of life's really all about. So help us today as we talked about this godly life. It's a hard one. It's something we have to do every day, every day in total pursuit of who you are. So God, it's not just coming for an hour on Sunday. That's not the godly life. The godly life's about every day. Every day committing to you as the owner of us. Committing to you as the person who is our, our kingdom owner. Committing to you as the person who's given us a platform. So God, today I pray that you just work in the hearts of your people. Work in my heart. Work in all the people who are watching on video. And, and those that are watching uh, that, that are here with us live. God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would stir us up and that we would stop thinking that just sitting in a pew is what you've called us to do, that we'd take the gospel message and be missionaries, take it to people across the street, around the corner, that we tell everybody, not just certain people, we tell everybody, because that's what you've called us to do. God, I pray that you'd bless your word today. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand. Once again, we're going to sing a verse of invitation. It won't be long. So do whatever God's speaking to you. The, the altars are open. If you need somebody to pray for you, you just uh, let us know. And we'd love to do that as we sing. Thank you so much for being here today, and, and, and I don't know about you, but there's just something about coming together and being able to worship together. I know some people can't be here, and I know some people are watching online, and, and that's great, and that's wonderful, but there's something about coming together as a community of believers to being able to worship, and, and I appreciate each and every one of y'all that are here today. I do have a couple announcements uh, that we do need to make sure that we know about, but before I do that, I want to thank a couple people uh, uh, we have uh, made some advancements in our technology here lately. Uh, first of all, uh, the, the countless hours that Bill has put in as far as getting us live streamed and, and the other uh, behind the scenes stuff that you don't always see. I appreciate him. I appreciate uh, uh, a couple of guys, uh, Randall, Jerry, and Jay, uh, for being willing to crawl up into the attic. That is not a very easy place to get to. Uh, and get up there pulling wires, running wires so that we can have our monitor in the back. I appreciate y'all guys for doing what y'all do, uh, stepping up and, and just giving your time. Uh, so I appreciate that so much, and I thank you. Uh, also, uh, guys, uh, here's one for you.
uh, a new Bible study for men uh, starting in March. The first Monday in March uh, at 630 down in the Fellowship Hall is uh, where we'll be meeting. I encourage you guys, if, if you're able to come out on Monday evening, I encourage you to do that. Uh, and being able to dive into the uh, God's Word, uh, not a better way than, than starting off your work week than coming out on a Monday evening and, and doing that. Also, uh, the Christians United, uh, the food bank, uh, a couple of different changes to that. Uh, we're, we're past the oatmeal part, and now we're on orange vegetables. Orange vegetables. Now, now that's the first look I had, too, uh, when I went over there. I was helping them out. Orange vegetables. Uh, that's carrots, which I don't eat, and, and, and sweet potatoes as well. Uh, I don't think there's any other orange vegetable, though. Uh, 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 yeah, maybe squash. But, but orange vegetables, uh, and the reason they do orange vegetables, they give two cans to every box. Uh, uh, of an orange vegetable, uh, uh, so so it's very important actually for those boxes, and then also bagged rice, which also can include boxes of rice as well. Uh, so those those will be our next items for this coming up month. I encourage you to uh, if you find a sale, hey, uh, make sure you tell somebody else about it so uh, we can uh, share in your savings as well. Uh, so uh, those are the two things there, and also uh, there is a work day coming up. In March, uh, March 26th, uh, Randall's going to be putting together a list of things to do. Uh, and, and you might be sitting there, well, I'm not really good at doing different things. Oh, there's something you can do uh, on the 26th. There's going to be something you can do. Uh, we got a lot of sprucing up to do, uh, some cleaning to do, maybe some painting to do. Uh, a, bunch of, a bunch of items that's going to be on the punch list uh, uh, that Randall's going to be giving us. So I encourage you to make plans. Go ahead and put that down on your calendar as, as far as uh, uh, making sure that you're here and able to help out with that. Uh, as we move into uh, prayer request time, uh, uh, there, there's several names that are on the list. Uh, I encourage you to make sure you go to our website. Uh, Bill have already mentioned that you can go there and see our sermons and see the past sermons. Maybe you've missed a week uh, or maybe you just want to recap. Uh, go back, go to the, uh, uh, the website, watch those. You can go to the YouTube channel as well. And you can also see them on the Maple Springs uh, family page. And that is also a good place to take your prayer requests as well, that family page. But please make sure you go to the website and put them on there uh, so we can uh, share all those prayer requests uh, and praise reports. And never forget the praise reports as well. Uh, but I do encourage you, I said this uh, a couple weeks back, if you haven't seen them, call them. Uh, there's one other thing that I want you to add to that list. Uh, yes, absolutely. If you haven't seen them lately, call them. Contact them in some way. Uh, I know some people are, are, are a little different as far as going and visiting. If that's an opportunity, hey, absolutely do that. But here's, here's the next step to that. If you haven't seen them, how about praying for them? Uh, I think all too often we, we, we forget that we have a certain power that, that the rest of the world don't have, that we're able to go to our Father and pray for these folks. Uh, so, so make sure you do that. If you haven't seen them, call them. Contact them some way. But most of all, if you haven't seen them, pray for them. I encourage you to do that. Uh, as we celebrate our offerings and tithes today, as we finish up, uh, I'm going to do things just a little bit different. Uh, I want you to do this. I, instead of just watching me and seeing me, uh, whether you're online or right here, I want you to do something other for me as we celebrate this time. I want you to just, just bow your heads and close your eyes and just listen for a moment. Uh, I, have a, I have a story to tell you. Uh, the story is actually... Uh, in Luke chapter 12, uh, it's a familiar passage uh, that we've all have read. But in this story, it talks about how Jesus is sitting there. It's Luke chapter 12, starting in verse 41, I believe. Uh, but in this, uh, in this passage, Jesus is sitting there, and he's actually sitting uh, uh, away from where the offering is being given. And he's, and, and he's seeing all these people that are coming in. And he sees... Uh, a bunch of people coming in and they're just putting large amounts of money in. And then he sees something else. He sees a woman coming in. And that woman, she just drops two pieces in. Two copper coins. Just pennies. In our day and time, it would just be pennies. In that moment that he took to watch her she dropped 
two coins in. And then he calls his disciples over and, and he says, guys, see this? See, see all these people that have come in and put such large amount? But this woman has come in. And not only did she put everything she had, she put her livelihood in there. Now we take that story that I just told you. And, and that story, uh, yeah, he's talking about money there. And I know we're celebrating with our offerings and tithes. And, and, I, and I tell you each and every week that you can go on tithely. Uh, there's a bucket in the back that you can put your offering in. You can mail it in. You can drop it in. And, and, and y'all know that. But don't miss the point of this story. This woman, in a moment, worshipped God. In a moment. How's your moments? How's your moments as you go through the week? Not just today. How's your moments? I encourage you to think about your moments as we celebrate our offers and tithes today. As we finish up today. As we get ready to come back tonight, how's your moments? Is your moments with God? Let's pray as we finish up. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. Father, we thank you for this message. Father, we thank you for this series, Father, an effective life. And I ask, Father, that it makes an impact on our lives. Father, I ask that it makes an impact on our moments. Father, we could be doing so many other things. But the moments we have with you. Wow, Father. Thank you for the moments. That we're able to worship you. Father, for the times that you give us that we're able to come together as a community. As a family. As brothers and sisters, Father, the moments, thank you. Now, Father, I just ask that you just lead us and guide us as we leave out today. Father, as we go our separate ways and, and, and up and down the roads and in and out of places, and not just today, but this coming week, Father, my prayer today is that we take advantage of our moments. Father, we thank you and we love you. And we ask all this in Christ's name. Amen. See you all this evening.